Welcome back to another episode of the Swim Swam Breakdown. I am your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. We've got Associate Editor Tori Hart coming to us from sunny downtown Oakland, California, and Swim Swam Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith coming to us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I will be this later this week. I'm doing practice and pancakes in Philadelphia. We're going to Jim Ellis's famous PDR on Thursday, and you guessed it, Penn University on Friday. We're doing a Matt Fallon breaststroke practice and pancakes. Get excited. Practice and cheesesteaks, Coleman. We're going to do practice <laughs> and cheesesteaks. The cheesesteak places are open 24 hours. We can go get you a 9 a.m. cheesesteak, no problem. Be on the lookout for our newest series, Practice and Cheesesteaks. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the news uh this week Janetta Audison uh released her first book I believe it's called Fry Free I don't know the Danish pronunciation uh but a newsworthy it admitted to ongoing bullying of a lot of frees uh do we think that this is okay for Janetta to put in her book I kind of have like a dual take on this, depending on how cynical you want to be. The cynical me says that it's okay to put in her book because it's going to sell more books than anything else. It's already gotten the book so much attention and that's why it's in there. Um, There's also part of me, if I want to sort of pretend like the money doesn't influence these things that feels like in her mind, this, this was going to absolve her of her crimes. This was going to insert her into the ever popular mental health conversation, um, that this was going to make her feel better about what she did. And I don't know if that's the reaction she got, um, or she got the reaction she wanted. Um, but you know, it's, I, it's one of those two things or both of those things. Um, I think both are okay. It's her book. She can, she can tell her version of it. I, I think, I think um, Lot is saying that it wasn't Janetta's story to tell. I disagree with that. Um, I think Janetta has to live with the criticism she receives from it, um, but I'm okay with it putting, with her putting it in the book. I mean, yeah, it definitely depends what the intent was. I mean, she tried to position herself as like a sympathetic character. She's, you know, coming forward with what she's done and it kind of backfired because she just looks like more of a jerk. And at the same time is saying that, uh, you know, Latte had like, you know, tried to, or, you know, positioned herself as someone that was a susceptible target to bullying. Like that's a definitely backhanded way of talking about this situation. And, you know, it seemed like Jeanette was trying to clear her conscience a little bit, completely backfired, but, you know, in terms of public perception of her, I don't know. I mean, like you said, Brayden, her, her publisher knew what they were doing. Like this is a chapter they chose to release uh, clearly because it would cause some alarm some interest I guess and then I believe Janetta also posted an apology of some sort on her Instagram but so it's an odd situation I don't know if it really went down as she personally intended it to I'd I'd love to be a fly on the wall and know because you know the publisher knows what's going to happen they see they see the train coming downhill from a mile away Um, I'd love to get them on and and see if if they were honest with uh, Janetta about how how that was going to be received and what the reaction is and what they were trying to accomplish because all these all these biographical books to an extent they're what the athlete wants to say but to an extent they're manufactured to to generate sales um, it, you know this is the very popular thing for people to do now and it's not it's never sort of a fully unadulterated the, what the swimmer wants to say there's always a heavy influence from from the publisher from the co-author from all these other people we actually have a former writer um Micah Hecht who works for I believe Penguin Books um but she works for a publisher and I'd love to talk to her about if the publishers are honest with with the subjects of the biographies about how this is going to play out or if they sometimes keep it a little guarded guarded because they're afraid of spooking the uh the signee we have reached out to the publisher uh the danish publisher so hopefully we will hear back from them and maybe even get them on the podcast who knows uh the most infuriating part of this whole saga to me was that both lada's post about on the subject and janetta's post were in danish and i could not read them (laughs) 
because they were in Instagram stories and Google <laughs> Translate doesn't work on Instagram stories. Exactly. Uh, so I didn't know exactly what was going on, but... You know, I uh, think this, the, there's an angle to this. Maybe this is what you were about to ask us, Coleman. You know, when you talk to the elite athletes, I, there's sort of this veneer put on it where they're all teammates and especially Team USA is, is really good at this, making it sound like they're all teams. But when you start to talk to them, there are conflicts. You know, they don't all get along all the time. They're competitors as much as their teammates. You know, if if you're, I don't want to put names into this because I know that'll make them mad, but if, if your competitor in the 100 back wins gold at your expense, it's not like you benefit from that in the way an NBA player would. If, if you're LeBron James's teammate and he wins MVP, there's sort of a, a glow of a radius around him that benefits everybody. Um, it's a lot more competitive among teammates than that. So I think maybe this opens a conversation about that um, and that, you know, pro athletes and international athletes deal with a lot of the same drama and garbage that youth athletes and club athletes deal with. They just don't talk about it because it's bad for business generally. I mean, I think, you know, something like the ISL, like a pro league coming in and, and marketing to, okay, now we have rivals, right? We have these battles that are happening regularly, but, but they haven't really done that either. And I think we kind of thought that that would give us more of an inside look of like what training actually looks like and what, how, how athletes actually interact at the very top. And we haven't seen it yet, but it would be cool if, <laughs> if we got a UFC esque thing where people are just, where, where we actually get to see um, the not so good side of it. The, uh, the ISL will always be too soft for that. They will never, they will never acknowledge true conflict. They, they've they've made that clear that they don't like true conflict. They might have some manufactured conflict, but they'll never have true conflict. And and it is disappointing. They should have been they should have been all over the Ryan Murphy Coleman Stewart beef, and, and then they would have had a follow up story. Tori knows this. This is how you do sports. You you when when the incident happened last year you you do something about it and then this year you do the coleman stewart redemption angle when he breaks the world record like this is how sports are supposed to be done um and if it's not going to happen in the isl i don't know where it's ever going to happen in swimming but at least we're we're getting little tastes of it more than we used to yeah if i'm the isl and i own basically the rights to to film all of these swimmers 24 7 and They've kind of implied before that that was, you know, in their plans to have a ton of behind the scenes content, huge missed opportunities just all around to just build on those. And I think even you'll see like, you know, MLB and, and NBA, like their main, you know, Twitter accounts kind of play like to an extent, like, you know, objective observer and they'll, you know, post quotes of NBA players or MLB players beefing and stuff like that. And um, yeah. No, it turns out ISL swimmers are great and love the venue and are just happy to be there even behind the scenes. That's all they ever talk about. Um, and so I assume, yeah, you know, when they go home to their girlfriends, they just, they just spend hours talking about how great it was to be a part of a team. I, I, I think that's a reasonable expectation. All right. Well, moving on to another team, uh, we saw Brooks Curry and Jack Janash. I think I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, LSU Summers throw down a 50 free Brooks Curry was 18, six, 18, seven, uh, his teammate Jack was 19, four. They did this suited, uh, after a, a full practice. Um, you know, obviously we've seen LSU's almost entire staff flip over with Rick Bishop coming in there. Um, but is this a, this is a good sign for LSU moving forward? I, think real, oh, I was going to say just real quick, can we get into the backstory? How do we end up with this video? How did this come out? I'm not privy to that. Uh, LSU sent us the video because it was a cool <laughs> video and they wanted, they wanted to get on the swim swam hype train. So yeah, basic, they just, they wanted to throw down a 50 free after a practice. They're like, Hey, we want to wear suits. We we're feeling good. We want to do a 50 free for time. And they did. And you know, they killed it. <laughs> I, I think we had to know LSU was going to get better with Rick Bishop, right? Like they've got, they've got sec money. Um, there's been some conflict with Rick Bishop and, and we see this a lot with new coaches. Um, and we'll see if, if anything comes of it, you know, sometimes these new coach sort of conflicts 
turn out to have some legs to them. Sometimes they just um, sort of flare up for a few years and then it turns out everything was fine or mostly fine or good enough. Um, but, you know, you ha- he had to make the team better, I think. He's got enough name recognition behind him with Maggie McNeil and Siobhan Hai and, and those swimmers. Um, it's ex- I'm sure it's exciting for LSU people that he's doing some work with the men's team too um, and, and improving them. You know, there's a lot of debate about where they're going to finish at NCAAs, and I just – I don't know if they have enough pieces this year to do anything much higher than than top – 18 or nine, you know, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in that range where they were last year. Um, but it's, it's a, I don't know, it's exciting and glad to see that Brooks Curry is coming back from the Olympics, still hungry, still swimming fast. Um, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. (laughs) Yeah. When it comes down to it, it's still, it's still, you know, one swimmer with these super splashy times up here. And I know they've got a strong diver too, but I don't know if that's enough to really make significant waves in, in the rankings. But I just want to go back to the video though. I kind of I came into this saying I was gonna I was gonna say, what is the point of sending us this video and does it just make life harder for them going forward? But now that I've just thought about it a little bit more, I've just made a 180 and I'm very here for this video and I think all teams should send us their most hyped <laughs> practice. Swim. Don't don't be a practice swim hater. I, <laughs> I've got a video from Indiana a fast 50 fly flat start video that we're going to do later today. So we're doing more race videos. Send us your hype race video practice videos. We love them. Teams, coaches do more. We love posting them. I mean, it's just like you want to grow our sport, you know, show what you're doing behind the scenes. As we were just saying, I, I, so I think the bigger story here is that his teammate, Jack Janash, I don't, again, don't know if I'm saying that right. 19.4, uh, his best, his personal best is 19.9, um, which signals to me that, that Brooks is, is pulling his teammates with him, right? He's had this massive improvement curve since he came to LSU. He was a, a, a junior national champion with Dynamo. He was a good swimmer. And then he goes to LSU and then he, you know, goes 41 SEC champion, makes the Olympic team. And then, uh, and, and now we see the effects of like, okay, he's actually doing, doing real things. And his teammates are like, oh, well, if Brooks can do that, like I swim with him every day, maybe I can do that too. And th- like, that's what that video shows me. It's like 19.4, you know, it, after a practice and the dude's best time is 19.9. Like, okay, maybe, maybe it could actually be a team thing. And obviously now with Rick Bishop, it seems, seems like they're moving in the right direction. All right, let's keep this moving in the right direction. Ooh, Diaseto announced he is officially going pro, which is more of a more of a thing that doesn't happen too often um, in Japan. But he's also going to be training in the U.S. He's going to be making multiple stops in the United States. I'm just curious, pure speculation. Where do you think Dia is going to be training? He's got to go to Michigan. I think he's going to Michigan. I think a few Japanese swimmers have been with Mike Bottom before. I think he's got to go to Salo, his ISL coach. That's the obvious one. That's the obvious one. I'm sure he'll do a few weeks with Marsh because that's what everybody does. Um, If if we're talking like dream scenarios, um, I'd like to see him do some time with Jack Bowerly maybe. I think that would be a a really good combo. I think his skill set overlaps with with – the swimmers jack coach as well wouldn't you love to do a practice in pancakes with chase kalich uh jay litherland and diaceto yeah, that would be that like was, an all-timer <laughs> that was my first pick when i was thinking where would i personally love to see him go i thought georgia and i couldn't find it i went to find it but i swear chase had at one point posted an instagram i don't know why i remember the specific thing of him hanging out with dia maybe at like Tampax. they had like gone out to dinner or something they were I think they're they're friends, but I might be completely misremembering that. But I was like, oh, this sounds like a really cute potential practice situation. Wouldn't you love to see Daya go from like the big bad city of Tokyo, Japan, one of the busiest and most hectic cities in the world, and then suddenly land in Athens, Georgia for a few <laughs> few weeks and just I would I would watch that daily vlog <laughs> as Daya Seto adjusts to life in Athens, Georgia. <laughs> Dude, Athens is cool. I, Athens, one of my favorite places to go for a swim meet or practice. They have great food there. Yeah, but uh, it's not Tokyo. It's, it's not. It's not Tokyo. Certainly, I I'm with you there, Tori. I'm pretty sure 
Chase has at least mentioned in an interview before that like him and Hagi, like he is good friends with uh, Kosuke Hagino, Kitajima. I feel like he posted a picture with Kitajima, like them getting sushi at Pan Packs or something, but, and, and Seto. And so that'd be, a, that'd be a great practice to see. Uh, but I guess hopefully Daya send us, send us your location. We'll come, we'll film practice. We have a little Daya tracker on the site. <laughs> What do they eat for breakfast in, in Tokyo? <laughs> what do you what? What do they eat for breakfast in Tokyo? I uh, think I seen on Instagram like a, a fried rice dish with an egg on top. That that would be my guess. Yeah. That seems good. I don't know if they have that in Athens though. Yeah. Problems are <laughs> <laughs> you definitely find it. Dude, it would be Cal. That was my actually my first thought. Um just, I mean, they have, they have great groups for everything. And I feel like him, him and Hugo could probably <laughs> throw down some, some yeah. pretty sweet, sweet sets, but all right, let's move on. Um, the ISL athletes nearly boycotted this week, uh, after continued league non-payments, do we see this being an issue moving into the playoffs, which start in like three weeks? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, I don't think the I, the athletes will really pull out. I think the athletes, I think that there's a few very influential athletes who can start these sort of things, get everybody all wound up. But I think when push comes to shove, I don't know if, I don't know if there's going to be a big movement to actually not show up um, at this. Th- this is the first big te- test of the athletes association, right? Like we've been told all along. Just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> we've been told all along that the athletes association exists to help the athletes better contend with FINA. Um, but the reason that messaging exists is because ISL's management funds and essentially controls the athletes association. But you know, the more traditional conflict is athletes association versus ISL. Like in, in, in any other league scenario, that's the primary conflict that you expect to see. Um, you know, the, the NBA players union also negotiates over whether it's players are allowed to go to the Olympics, for example. Um, but that's, that's not the primary conflict. And so it's like, is Matt Biondi going to step up for the athletes here? And the answer is, Probably not because who's signing Matt Biondi's paycheck? It's not the athletes. Um, who, who decides if Matt Biondi gets to continue in his role? It's not the athletes. So I, I think ultimately they'll swim. Um, to me, this feels more like something that would come as we head towards next season when they're trying to get athletes to sign up. Because I think, I think this was a little bit of a conflict trying to get athletes to sign up for the draft this year. Um, but next year it, it just feels like it could be a lot worse. Like that, that conversation could be a lot harder and that it's with the world championship there with the European championships, with the Commonwealth games. I just, I could see athletes letting this one go next year if something isn't changed. Yeah. I mean, as to whether the boycott would go down now, my question is sort of like, why now? I mean, this has been, this is basically saying the quiet part out loud that we've known since the beginning. I mean, I did a story last year for another outlet on kind of the ISL's public um, kind of, you know, shiny, fun, put together perception when behind the scenes swimmers have had this sort of, um, these sort of issues going on all along. And there's a lot of, you know, potential mismanagement going on. And at this point, I think, you know, a lot of the swimmers, at least, you know, when I spoke to them, were kind of thinking, if this is for the greater good of the sport and I've, you know, maybe been using my career for years now to fight for the greater good of the sport, getting not, you know, paid immediately is, is kind of beside the point and they more want the league to go on and, and, you know, look at the big picture. Um, I think the other complicating factor is that some swimmers, if I have been reading right, have been paid. So there's that sort of internal disparity going on as well. Well, I mean, they should just set a schedule and pay them on it. Like that's, <laughs> This is not like, this is not an oil company that can play these games and sort of drag it out. This is a public facing business where there is a PR hit to be taken. We know these kind of things happen in business everywhere. Um, delaying payments to, to, cause you, it's without getting into the math of it, uh, the longer you delay a payment, the better it is for you financially. Um, 
And so you can get away with that maybe in a lot of the arenas that Konstantin Grigorishin works in. Uh, but when, when the people you're not paying have all the sort of public power, I'll say, you know, they, they've got the publicity power, they've got the social media followers, all those things. Um, you can't get away with it. I, to me, I'm wondering if the timing is, if there's something going on with the general managers. Um, and, and they generally tow the league line publicly, but you, when you start talking to kind of secondary sources, it, it sounds like maybe the general managers have hit a sort of breaking point. Um, and if the athletes suddenly have the uh, support of those general managers, maybe that's what would drive some actual change. So I'm, I'm curious as to whether, like, obviously the athletes, you want to get paid as an athlete, but do they have to put money up? Like, do they have to pay for flights, hotel rooms, anything like that when they're actually competing? Um, so like, does it take money out of their pocket or are they just waiting for the money that's already promised to them? As far as we know, the league's basically got an internal um, travel agent and, and they book all that. They take care of that. The athletes don't have to wait for, they don't have to like book their own flights and wait for reimbursement. Um, as I understand, that's all taken care of. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I was just curious about that. That's, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a positive, but still not an ideal situation. I guess we'll see how the playoffs uh, progress moving forward or if there's any more noise on this, but now it is time for our favorite game show at the swim swim breakdown. Let's play sink or swim. Kyle Chalmers drops a 45.03 free bomb in Doha, number three swim all time in that event. Will we see a 100 free world record from Chalmers at Kazan at the next World Cup stop? Oh, at the next World Cup stop? Uh, I think no. I think we'll see it this year, either at the ISL final or short course worlds, depending on what he does. Um, I don't think I don't think we'll see it in Kazan. I think he needs another couple of meets. So I am so that's a sink. sinking. I am sinking. I'm playing the game correctly, and I am sinking that. I had this written down before you said it, so I could prove that I had an original thought about it. But I also Show was going to say, "Show us." Even my my I crammed for this like I was back in college because. <laughs> that's what my life is kind of like but I also said I don't think we'll see it um you know in the next couple of weeks but setting up a battle with with Russell and the ISL would be great it'd be great for the ISL if, if that went down obviously um and I think you know the record will go down between one of the two of them but I think that it's happening uh, hot, hot take Tori did you come up with that all on your own yes what <laughs> I just you can't read it but it says think think Chalmers in order to set up ISL battle. Pete and repeat went to the river. Pete fell in. Who was left? Boring. All right. You guys are no fun. Let's, let's see if this is a little more fun. Shane Casas returns to training at Texas A&M with the pro group for now. Dun, dun, dun. Will this be an amicable transition back to Aggie land for Shane? I... I think amicable might be a word for it. I, I think his teammates at this point are just kind of like, it's, it's Shane being Shane. And I think by now they know who he is and, and sort of how he moves through the world. So um, I think it'll be fine. I don't think anybody's going to be his best friend when he comes back, but I think they'll, they'll train with him and take the, the, the afterglow of Shane Casas until he leaves again for Texas, which it sounds like he's still planning on doing so. I will swim amicable. I think it's something from the outside, you know, just looking on the situation, something has clearly gone awry. I mean, it sounds like maybe he didn't, you know, do his, do his research from looking into what it would take to move over to Texas. I don't know exactly just his quotes, you know, he, he's saying you know, that's my understanding of it. And I think this is what needs to happen. And if I'm him, I would want to have that kind of stuff locked down uh, before, you know, making a decision publicly like that. But um yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine he'd be going back to a and if it wasn't amicable. I mean, I'm sure he could find another pool, like another, you know, club coach, maybe who would be willing to have him if he didn't have an amicable, amicable landing spot. So, yeah, I'm not going to sink him going back there and say that, you know, he's going to have a horrible time. I think, yeah, swim will be amicable, but just a very odd situation all around. 
but I love that he didn't just give us the, I'm so grateful to Texas A&M for welcoming me back. I, I love that he's kind of just like, he's walking us through the process. And then this is probably this kind of messy situation is probably not that unusual. I just, I just love that he's allowing us to take this journey with him. We love it. Again, send us, send us your messy journeys. <laughs> we, we love talking about them. We love to hear it. All right. After the Cal Utah dual meet this weekend, where we saw times that again, were fairly unusual for Cal, not necessarily up to their standards after seeing Stanford dual Utah a week or two prior, how real do we, or sorry, do we think the Utah effect is real sink or swim? I want to call back to um, Utah, Arizona, circa, I don't know, 2015 or 2016. And Arizona went to Utah and lost and came back. And that was basically the beginning of the end for Eric Hansen at Arizona. So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, this was this was the like 2 a.m. workout after the bus gets back from a six hour drive scenario um, that dovetailed into some other issues. Um, but this Utah pool effect is not new. It's been going on. It's been, been eating up PAC 12 opponents for years. Um, so I am, I am swimming the Utah pool, home pool advantage, away pool disadvantage. Yeah. I mean, I'm not totally sure what we're singing or swimming. Like, are we swimming that altitude affects athletes and well, it's altitude. Yes. It's a shallow pool. Right. There's a lot of factors yes. there. I mean, yeah, yeah Cal, it seems like, really bad, though, doesn't it? It. Uh, I mean, I think, it, yeah, this was this maybe wasn't the best sinker swim on my part, but like we saw Stanford go there and just swim really bad times, and like they won, but they like were not good times, and everyone kind of freaked out and was like, "The Stanford's done for." And then we saw Cal, the Cal men go there this weekend and like they swam similar time, right? Like someone was like, oh, well, they're still way faster than Stanford and Braden. There's someone else. Maybe it was Braden. It's actually like, no, it's like half and half. Like they're the same, like they're the same kind of times. I like when you, um, you exert your emotion via your hair. That makes me happy. (laughs) Um, so, I mean, I think it's, I think people were a little, t- were, here's a better sink or swim. Were people too harsh on Stanford well, <laughs> after um, seeing the cow? Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, so we reported this week that 53% would prefer a USA versus Australia in a future duel in the pool. Was this in reference to something? Because like it, it is dual in the pool coming back or is this just a purely fantasy situation? This was a James Sutherland fantasy. He, he stays up at night and dreams up these scenarios. <laughs> so, so the question is, will we ever see another dual in the pool <laughs> period swim? Because I think as we move back to sort of, well, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it would, it's gotten so crowded with the ISL. So that's where I hesitate, but I do think that the federations are going to see growing opportunities um, to, to sort of create a made for television event. Um, I'd like to, the best suggestion I saw was USA versus Commonwealth. I think that would be the most um, competitive of the suggestions I saw, um, but I'm, sw- I'm swimming that we'll see it again someday. I'm going to sink it for now. I think, like you said, the ISL and, you know, to an extent, the, the FINA World Cup, there's a lot of opportunity right now for swimmers to fill out their calendars and, um, you know, see opponents that they, you know, maybe weren't seeing a couple years ago. Um, I would love to see, and what I think might be more just feasible logistically is kind of another college challenge type scenario, which I believe hasn't happened recently, right? Huh. Um, yeah, I was at the one, I think, in 2017. It was a super fun atmosphere, just like, um a great setup all around and i think pretty relatively easy to pull off so i think you know that type of format might come back and our closer as always uh i'm gonna not not strictly a sink or swim but i'm gonna phrase this uh, specifically we saw pd and pranilla both move on to their respective next rounds of dancing with the whoever's was it more impressive that pranilla got another top spot this week or that PD moved on 
with the dance that he did. Adam Peaty, your 2021 Strictly Come Dancing champion. Um, Petey's making a comeback. What? He's seen all the chaos in the ISL. He wants nothing to do with it. And that has motivated him to really put in some extra effort, some extra time on the dance floor. I went to the ballet yesterday, so I consider myself an expert in this in this field right now. Um, and Adam Petey will win Strictly Come Dancing. I assume motivated by this podcast. Um, we gave him some good bulletin board material last week. We knew what we were doing. We were cheering for our boy the whole time. And he's on his road to victory. We're going to see a swimmer sweep. Pernilla is going to win two. It's going to be two for two for swimmers. I don't think that he was a man lacking in confidence, but I will say I was very impressed with his sheer ability to just go out there and, and do what he did. Um, he was just laying it all on the line. Uh, I, I think Pernilla might actually win. I think for PD, if I understand correctly, it now goes into the fan voting portion of the competition. And I think that real that really will play out well for him. Boost we're going to see more DV people. shirts. More DV <laughs> shirts. DVs, those were some tight jeans. Or lifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Pernilla continues to impress as a sheer dancer. I mean, she looks great out there. I think she legitimately is probably going to win that. PD, though, the confidence, the sheer confidence is a marvel. I can't say I was that impressed with his dance this week. I'm I'm stoked that he moved on. I'm I'm team Petey all the way, but like I... Yeah, but you're still gonna call in and vote for him. <laughs> well, yeah, totally. <laughs> also seen he posted on Instagram confirming that he was not or he is not retiring from swimming. <laughs> But so many people had asked him if Important. he was enough, if he was so, you know, engrossed in the dancing that it seemed like he wasn't coming back to swimming, but he did confirm he does plan to race again. He's well, just was. chasing that bag. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been the Swim Swim Breakdown. Tune in next week for next week's breakdown. Do you, do you guys think I could pull off the DP? No. I don't I don't see it Braden. I know I know you're a dance star and fanatic and you know in that pose maybe though. <laughs>